Welcome back to our Holidays with Our Heroes series on Eco Ask Why. I hope you're enjoying these as much as I am and just hearing these hero stories each week as we get ready for this wonderful holiday season together. And at week of Christmas, get ready because there's going to be a surprise nobody's expecting and I know you're going to love it. Now, this episode, I sat down with Richie Fortenberry, and you may remember Richie from episode 141, where he talked about safety and security. Remember, he had that really cool traffic light example? Well, Richie, he came back, and he shared his story for us, and let me tell you what, he is full of passion about his career, and you're going to quickly see why he is our hero as he unpacks his amazing story. And you know what? Speaking of stories... We're still getting those war stories, and I'm going to tell you what, they have been pretty incredible. The stories have been funny, they've been inspiring, they've been outright unbelievable. So it's not too late. You can go to Instagram or Facebook and you DM us, and there's links right in the show notes on how to do that. So if you have any questions, just hit us up. We're here to answer them. We want to make that super easy, but those war stories are going to be amazing. Now... It's time to get some insight into Richie Fortenberry's amazing journey. Cue the music. Welcome to Eco Ask Why. Today we have a hero episode, and I'm very excited to have with me Mr. Richie Fortenberry, who is the consulting engineer and operations manager at Prism Systems. So, welcome, Richie. Thank you. How are you doing today? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Now, you're out of Alabama, right? Yep, Birmingham. Birmingham. Now, are you a Tide fan? I'm not. not. Uh, yeah, my wife is. My uh, wife I'm, is. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, who, uh, I got to just get a storm. So, who do you pull for if you're not a Tide fan? Uh, I, uh, I'm i more of a troll. Uh, so, I uh, I pull for whatever team uh, that uh, enables me best to make fun of my friends. <laughs> So it's often whoever's playing Alabama, uh, you know, that type of thing. I hear you. I hear you. Well, that's a, at least you're honest about it, man. At least you're honest. <laughs> <laughs> well, we love these these hero conversations, Richie, just to get started, to hearing about everybody's journey. So give, what can you tell us about yours? Yeah. Uh, so journey is in how I got where I'm at, you know, professionally and that type of thing. Yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll, I'll go way back. Uh, so I played in um, in bands, uh, you know, guitar player in, in, in my teens and 20s. And I, I operated a small home recording studio for recording demo tapes and such in a town that had uh, a rural Mississippi town that had uh, no need at all for a recording studio. But uh, but I, I wanted that sparked an interest in me. And I wanted to go to school to, to learn more about audio engineering. Um, and this, I had actually got a, gotten accepted into a, a trade school out in, in Arizona, uh, was gearing up to go and, uh, nine 11 happened. And I started thinking about the wisdom of, uh, of going all in on a trade school that was based on entertainment exclusively, um, not knowing where the economy and, you know, what uncertainty was going to, going to follow the attack. So I started looking into actual degree programs. Um, I found out that the first degree audio engineers came out of uh, the electrical engineering program at the University of Miami. Uh, so I started working towards electrical engineering uh, courses, started at a community college and, and started working towards, uh, ended up at University of South Alabama, which was just over the line in Mobile, Alabama. I got in-state tuition. Um, so that's that's why I chose that school. Uh, I found the topic of engineering uh enjoyment or uh, enjoy enjoyable in and of itself uh, particularly classes that where i had to deal with uh with logic and writing code and you know started to realize that there's you know there's a there's a difference in well-written code and poorly written code or a well-architected system or one that's just thrown together and these differences can be irrespective of function i mean it's, it's true that a well-written piece of code uh, often performs better than than a, a hacked uh, piece of code, or um, you know, or, or certainly more supportable than a poorly written one. But aside from that, um, I became interested in designing things well 
for the sake of designing things well. Um, there's there's such a thing as beautiful code. Um, so it, it's it's a little bit of an art, a little bit of a science, and it, it's really something that appealed to me. So I wound up with uh, with uh, a bachelor's in electrical engineering from the University of South Alabama. I went on to get a, a master's in computer engineering at Syracuse. Um, and neither of, neither of those degrees have anything to do with recording demo tapes in my basement any longer. But, um, but Syracuse in particular pointed me further into the topic of cybersecurity. Um, Syracuse offers master's degrees in computer science, um, computer engineering, and cybersecurity out of the same school. And there's a great deal of overlap uh, between those programs depending on how you structure your electives. So my master's uh, in computer engineering wound up having a one class difference from their master's in cybersecurity just because of the electives that I took. So, so it's more of computer engineering degree with emphasis on device and network security. Um, so that's, that's, that's driven a lot of my, um, you know, over the last five or so years. Yeah. Uh, interest in, in security of of control systems and devices. Now, did you go to and, security Syracuse on, on campus, or was that an online program? How'd you do that? I've I've never I, I've never been to campus. I've never I don't okay. think I've been within a hundred miles of it. Uh, it was all online. Okay. Um, and uh, so and but I that was while I was still uh, working at Prism Systems, the company that I. Okay. I currently work for. So I, I actually interned with Prism um, in my last year of undergrad uh, and hired on full time about uh, 14 years ago, I think, some, something close to that. Uh, so I had jobs throughout my undergrad and before then, um, but Prism is the only place I've ever worked uh, in my professional career. And I currently serve as the operations manager for Birmingham, um, which is a fully remote office at this point, as well as uh, consulting engineer. Wow. Okay. Well, man, it sounds like you had a, a, a fun time there at Prism a long time. So you've been there your whole career. I'm the same way at Eco. I guess when you find a place that you like and they treat you right, you stay there, right? Yeah. And it, it's not an uncommon story at Prism. Um, there's a, you know, a lot of the guys that were working here when I hired on still work there. Um, so it's a, it's a, it's a, uh, an indication of, of health and, yeah. And a positive culture within a company. I was getting ready to say that culture has got to just be, you know, top notch, outstanding. So we're, we're going to unpack more about the, the, the band and the studio and the, and the music stuff a little bit later, because I definitely want to learn more, but let's stay on the, the professional track. You, you serve a lot of industries. You know, we've talked to you. We, we know your passion around cybersecurity, OT, uh, safety, you know, what are you seeing out there? I mean, because you, you, you touch so many different areas as some of the biggest challenges in industry. There, there's been a, there, there is, and there has been a lot of hype around and well-earned hype around uh, the industrial internet of things and industry 4.0. 4. You hear that term thrown about. A lot of buzzwords, man. A lot of buzzwords out there. Yeah. So it, it, it's exciting uh, to be in industry right now. Um, you know, some are likening it to being on the verge of, an, of a second industrial revolution so, uh, and I also think there is, um, there is, and will be continue to be a much greater demand uh, and appetite for remote work. Um, the the pandemic showed us that, you know, while many jobs do require persistent presence on site and will continue to do so, uh, many don't. But there there are more jobs than I think we recognized before that can be performed fully or partially re remotely. Uh, without substantial reduction in effectiveness. So with with this industry 4.0 concept, we're talking about connecting a lot more things in our facilities or our distributed systems up to the internet. Mm -hmm. And with the possibility of, uh, of a continued and, and larger remote workforce, we're talking about connecting more external resources from the internet down to our internal networks. So we're con connecting more and more things to our network and, um, uh, and you know, we're that, that offers exposure. Um, both of these, these things, this, this people connecting to our network and connecting our network up to the internet, more devices up to the internet. Uh, they're both train wrecks in the making if we don't get uh, more serious as an industry about cybersecurity. Uh, so I would, I would point to that as, uh, globally cybersecurity, securing our, our systems better, 
as the greatest challenge facing us right now. No doubt. And it's, I mean, we see it all around and, you know, thankfully we have people like you, our heroes out there, Richie, that understand the topic and can help industry get safer, get more secure. So I just thank you so much. And, and we also love to try to give advice to people that are new to industry and maybe they're, they're considering coming over here and, and, and starting a career path. So speak to that young person who may be thinking about that. Any advice you would give? Yeah. Um, so I, I guess I'm thinking of, um, I have in mind, you know, college students that are uh, working through, you know, there's a lot you can do with an electrical engineering, computer engineering, computer science degree. Um, so I guess I, with those people in mind, I would say if you're thinking about controls, um, which is, you know, what I do, um, focus on proper software design and treat writing code for PLCs and DCSs with the same core principles as you designed a traditional software application. Um, the days of treating, you know, PLCs were, uh, we used to have these big uh, walls of relays, this relay logic, which is why, this is why uh, ladder logic looks the way it does. It's a simulation of the, of the drawings that, that, uh, that describe relay logic. Um, so r rather than, than that, that very large wall of, of relays, uh, somebody had the great idea of, hey, let's make this specialized device, this PLC that that uh, that serves as a small version of, of doing what that wall can do. Well, those days are gone. Um, PLCs and DCSs and stuff, they're, they're, they're much closer to a specialized industrial computer that's capable of executing complex software now than they are the PLCs of old that are just a replacement for a big wall of relays. Um, they're highly capable, capable devices. The lines are blurring between PLCs and industrial computers. They have been blurry for a while. Um, and the people that will be more successful in the next generation of controls engineers will be those that are more oriented in traditional software development. Uh, I think we'll see more and more hardware manufacturers allowing the user base to extend the capabilities of the off the shelf software products that are used to connect and, and program to controls hardware. Um, so being grounded in software development helps that as well. If you're able to, to, uh, to workflow and automate your own workflow, uh, regarding how we treat development on, on these controls devices. Um, I also think it's important in a small, you know, Prism is a, it's bigger, bigger now than it was, but, um, I think we're at like 70 something people. Uh, so we're not a huge company. We're still a small company. Um, and in that that type of environment, uh, I think it's helpful to understand uh, to take everything that your company tries to do well, and and try to to understand that every piece of it on some level. So um, try to become an expert in your specific role, but also try to build aptitude and be at least conversational in other technical roles. At, at Prism, we have controls engineers. Uh, we write software applications. We have a small group uh, developing hardware. Uh, and then we have a, you know, a, a quickly growing um, industrial networking and cybersecurity presence. Uh, these di disciplines frequently intersect in very, to varying degrees, uh, depending on the projects we're working on. And I think it's important for everyone in such an environment, um, and particularly for people newly entering the industry, to have some proficiency across, you know, whatever skill sets are available to you and your company. Um, I also think it's important. Um, you know, I, I think we need to be telling uh, our younger engineers this um, as part of our onboarding process, that it's important not to run yourself into the ground. Um, you know, it's, it's, especially as a new guy, it's important to work hard, um, prove your worth to the company, but you know, sometimes it's hard to regulate yourself and not go over, overboard with that such that you're miserable or you're doing things like neglecting personal relationships. Uh, some industries are worse than others about burnout. Um, the sad fact is that there are companies and industries out there that will run you into the ground, uh, they, that intend to run you into the, into the ground and then just replace you with the next guy. Um, and then when they burn that guy out, they'll re replace him with the next guy. Um, so, but there are also good companies out there that want to see you successful and balanced. Um, but even those companies rely on you to recognize and communicate when you're hitting your limits. 
Um, so understanding and respecting those limits is important as is contributing, you know, alongside contributing as best you can to your company, um, while also being mindful of your mental health and the, the health of your relationships as well. That's, that's great advice. And I tell you, the last piece is not something we've heard. I don't think we've heard anybody uh, talk about that, that self-awareness to really check in. And, you know, you, I guess you feel like if you're young and you hit the, you get a new job, you want to make that good first impression. And then you want to make that good second impression. And you, you find yourself saying yes to everything. Um, that's not always the right answer. That's not always the best path forward. So, you know, kudos to you for recognizing that and calling it out. Yeah. And it, you know, it's, it's, uh, we get, you know, awfully profit focused and, um, and, you know, I, I manage people, um, to the degree that I, that I manage them. I do rely on them to tell me whenever they're, uh, you know, if you want to go out, if you're, if you're a type that likes to work 80 hours a week, or if you're a phase in life where that's just, that fits you, you know, by all means. And it, you know, it is important to, to, um, to, to make a point and, and to, um, to, to demonstrate your, your importance to, to the company. But, um, but especially as people get older, uh, start and start families or even, you know, people without families that are, uh, you know, struggling to maintain connections to, uh, healthy connections to people because of their workload that we've got to do something about that. Because if we, you know, it's, it's, it's profit that drives companies to run those people into the ground, but it's, it's short-sighted pursuit of profit. Um, so what we should be focusing on is building, um, useful and, and healthy, uh, engineers, because if we dump all this, um, even from a profit, uh, a long-term profit standpoint, because if we dump all this training into a person and, and then burn them out, you know, burn out a talented person and, you know, in five years into their career, then we've lost all of that, all of their potential and all of their talent uh, in the industry. So if we care about the industry and care about maintaining the talent in our industry, um, then we, we need to care about the health and the well being of, of the engineers that we're, we're training. No doubt. And I mean, and one thing we're hearing too, Richie, is just not just taking care of the talent, but attracting the talent. And, and that can be so hard, that workforce attrition, the skills gap that's out there. And sometimes it, maybe it's just a, a, people have perceptions about industry, right? And they're not always right. So, if, you know, you've been out there, you've been supporting it. Any, any myths out there that you would just like to destroy right now just to get them out the way to maybe help explain to someone who's considering it, hey, this, this, this is what people say, but this is reality. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll refer back to our, our last, uh, our last talk together on, on the topic of, of safety and security. Um, uh, most of what I've done over the last, uh, you know, it's, it's been years, I guess, that I've, I've been uh, working pretty heavily in, in a themed entertainment environment. Um, and, and that industry in, in particular is very, very safety oriented. Um, you know, you're, you're putting people on, on vehicles that are uh, running at very expensive pieces of animatronic and, and also vehicles, other vehicles full of people. So uh, you have to be really, really serious about uh, and really thorough in your evaluation of safety. Uh, so a, a big part of the design of, the, of those, those attractions are, are centered around not so much the function, but the, the functional safety. Um, so, it, but on the topic of, of safety, and it, it's true of other industries as well, we, we, we put all this thought and all this uh, dedication to designing the safety of our systems, uh, but we, you know, we put very little thought into the security of, um, or, you know, a relatively small uh, amount of thought towards the security of our systems. Um, and I've, I've, I talked about it in the, in the last podcast we did, and, and I'll, I'll reiterate now that if a system isn't, isn't, uh, isn't secure, then it can't be said to be safe because the, we have to break out of this understanding of, of safety within the context of what the PLC and safety standards that drive our, our safety process. Um, we, we have to break out ourselves out of that box. That's a, that world that the PLC and the safety standards understand as, as a, as an approximation of, of our own world. Um, but the true safety that we care about is in our own world where we don't want to be injured or we don't want to be killed. And uh, 
so we, we need to be thinking more about the impact that that failures in security have on our safety. And I've I've uh, I've demonstrated that with attacks that I've written and and uh, demos that I've built to to demonstrate that um, that there there are ways that when you start dealing in the context uh, that the PLC doesn't understand, there are ways to affect um, the safety of a system in a way that the PLC can't can't understand or can't uh, can't anticipate or can't respond to. Right, right. Well, I'll tell you one thing, Rich, it's very clear, and I'm sure our, our listeners and our viewers, they're, they're picking it up. You're passionate around this topic, man. I love it because it's your type of knowledge and wisdom that you're sharing with others, just really walking through those myths right there, that's going to inspire that next generation to want to come in and, and join industry. And I'm just curious, what, when are you the happiest at work? What, what work are you doing that, that gives you that uh, fulfillment? Um, well, I, I think that's, you know, my answer to that would have, would have been different at different points in my career. It, I think it used to be when I did something well on my own. Um, my, my first solo project was, was on a Modicon 984. Um, our controls manager, Ron, who is like me, um, early in his career came into prism. He's, he's, he was my manager when I started on, he's still the engineering manager um at prism um but he came to my cubicle one day with a modicon book and said hey you're the new modicon expert um and uh so it was a fairly simple uh, machine control on a uh on a device in an r d uh unit at a, at a um, food and beverage manufacturer and it, so it wasn't a major project or anything but i remember feeling like so proud of, of getting through my first one without help um you know, I, I, I stuck with the things I was struggling with and I figured it out and I got there on site and kind of worked and it kind of didn't, but then I made it work. And uh, so, yeah, it was a, that point stands out as, you know, in the early years of my career and I'm, you know, I'm still in my thirties. It's not like I'm a, um, you know, a seasoned vet, uh, but the um, those, those were the things that kind of stick out to me in the early parts. Yeah. Um, and then, but, you know, I remember a, a couple of years after that, you know, I was so proud of that job. Then a couple of years later, uh, I looked back to that as a reference for doing another uh, Modicon project. And I uh, was just like, man, I wish I could sneak back into that facility and fix all of my bad practices. <laughs> uh, so you, you know, you kind of, um, your perception of the things that, that made you feel fulfilled before kind of changes as well. Yeah. But anyway, it, it, it used to be solo projects that went well or a particularly difficult uh, problem that I solved or something novel I contributed to a code base that a lot of us were working on even. Um, I think now for me, uh, I'm, I'm more fulfilled when a, when a team effort goes well. Yeah. You know, there, there's, an, there's added complexity in a, in a team format. It's kind of like an, an engineering problem in itself. Uh, when a team kind of comes together and figures out how to work well, uh, and it's a really rewarding experience to be a part of a team that supports each other well and, and works ef efficiently and and um, it doesn't think too highly of themselves and feels free to be direct with one another in, in graceful ways. Um, you know, that's 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 a that's a harder state to achieve than a um, you know properly functioning code base. I think you got that right. And I could definitely just tell by your answer your evolution as over your career so i mean hats off to you it sounds like you uh had, had a lot of things that make you have made you happy and now they're even different these things are different now but uh you're helping so many people man so that, that's awesome and I, it also speaks to the culture of prism again just by your answers that that says a lot about the company you're at so how about we talk a little bit outside of work for now, because I, I I like to circle back to some of the things that you were you mentioned at the very beginning. So, any hobbies, man? What do you enjoy doing for fun? Uh, so yeah, I mean, music is still uh, is still a hobby. It's not a uh, you know, it's not the the uh, the like the defining passion that that it was in my younger days. But um, it's just you know, it's something I do to around the house, but, um, I think probably the, the more, uh, prominent and one of the most longstanding of my hobbies would be woodworking. Okay. Uh, I spent my summers 
the latter part of, of high school, working with the crew, uh, framing houses. And then uh, in college, the, uh, uh, the pastor of a church that I went to at the time uh, was also built cabinets. So he had a little cabinet shop that I, uh, I started working on um, cabinetry and some finished carpentry while I was in college and um, getting kind of more and more detailed in my, my carpentry and woodworking. Uh, and since then, uh, I've, I've moved to onto more detailed pursuits of you know, building furniture. And um, I have a, a well-appointed wood shop at this point. Uh, I try to get some time in there at least, you know, once a week or so. Um, when you're, when you're, when you work primarily in a job like programming, uh, taking time to work with your hands and create a physical thing um, yeah. can be balancing, uh, kind of getting in a groove and, you know, letting, uh, let, giving your mind some space to think while you're doing this kind of deep work. It's uh, all those are good, good fits for, for the woodworking. Um, there was a guy, uh, I don't know if his name will ring any bells for anyone, but there was a guy named George Nakashima. That was a, he was a Japanese American architect. Um, and he was interned in a, uh, in a camp during the second world war. Um, and this is, you know, he, he, I think he went to MIT, uh, for architecture and he'd gone to, uh, France and, and, um, done a good deal of work was a respected architect uh, came back and then got put into a internment camp. Um, but while he was in that camp, uh, he met a, um, a, a carpenter that was skilled in traditional Japanese carpentry techniques. And George learned from this guy, uh, while interned, well, traditional Japanese woodworking, uh, you should look that up on YouTube if you have any, any interest in, in some of these things, but it has some of the most beautiful and intricate joinery that you'll find. And a lot of it's hand cut and just really patient, um, beautiful work. Um, anyway, so Nakashima, uh, once, once released from his internment camp, went on to combine his architectural skills with his newly found woodworking talent and became one of the more influential uh, furniture makers of the last century. All this live edge furniture where it kind of looks like more natural uh -huh. that's that's those are techniques that, that he he pioneered but um or you know he popularized in america anyway but he, he wrote a book i say that to say he, he wrote a book called the soul of a tree that romanticizes and spiritualizes woodworking in a way that i wouldn't but gives some insight uh, and useful opinions on woodworking and he discusses woodworking as as a way of giving a tree a second life and i, I think that's kind of beautiful um so, you, you know, you've got, you know, our domestic hardwoods. In some cases, these trees were present at the nation's founding, you know, endured the Civil War, maybe with some scars as a result, um, you know, only to get a disease later and, and come down. So it's nice to think about uh, giving those trees a second life as something beautiful and useful for generations to come. So I've, I've tried to do that. I've, I've made uh, pieces of furniture and various trinkets for, um, for many of my friends and it's, it's always nice to go to someone's home and, and see an item that I built in use in their everyday life or in their home. Uh, and, and that, so that's, I guess, another object that makes woodworking kind of a, a solid hobby for, for me. That's very cool, man. Very Now what's the, what's the coolest piece of woodworking um, uh, equipment that you have in your wood shop? Uh, well, uh, the ones that when someone comes and you know hangs out in the shop with me and watches me build something the ones that tend to be popular for people to watch are um, my wood lathe where I'll, I'll turn a bowl or a, some sort of vessel um or uh i have an electric planer that um most of the, the things that i build i buy lumber from that's you know seasoned from a sawmill but it's still rough uh rough cut lumber and then i mill it all down to to dimensions um so if you buy a one by four poplar at Home Depot or Lowe's, um, you know, it's the one by four is, is what it was approximately when they started milling it down, but it's really, it's not one inch thick, it's three quarters inch thick. Um, so I do something similar where I'll take a, a four quarter or eight quarter uh, piece of lumber and I'll cut it to the dimensions I need and plane it. So, but that, the whole process of planing something down where it's, it looks like this, you know, this rough piece of lumber and then you run it through the, the planer and then suddenly the grain is exposed and, yeah. you know, one pass through and suddenly you, you see some of the beauty that was hiding underneath there. Um, my favorite tool is I have a saw stop table saw 
And it is my favorite tool because I ran my thumb through my previous table saw. Oh, wow. Uh, <laughs> you know, luckily, I mean, I kept it, but, uh, I, you know, I, there's some more dexterous tasks that I, I don't do as well with it anymore, but um, just because of the nerve damage, but yeah. uh, it was also all soft, all soft tissue damage. But it's, um, you know, there's a, there's an interesting safety lesson to be learned there too. And that, um, a friend of mine, it was a really fortunate, uh, situation. If you're going to run your hand through a table saw, um, I was making some, some, uh, shaker style cabinet doors for a friend of mine. And he's a, he's a surgeon. He was standing beside me while I was running my table saw. And I was literally talking to him about safety procedures on a table saw. You know, this is, you never take your hand this way. You, you, you use your blade guard, you, all these things that, that, you know, are intended to keep a table saw safe yeah. while I was talking. So it's not like I was absentmindedly working and not thinking about safety. I was talking about safety when I ran my thumb through my table saw. Um, I pushed my non-dominant hand uh, and slipped and it made it underneath the guard. Luckily I had the blade uh, not, not too far above the stock that I was cutting. Um, and my surgeon, my surgeon friend had a kit and he, uh, he stitched things back together best he could at the kitchen table. And, you know, I, I didn't even have to go to the emergency room, but it was gruesome. Um, it was a pretty gruesome injury, but, um, so my favorite tool is a saw stop because it, uh, if you touch it while the blade's going, it, uh, there's an aluminum component that jams up into the blade and the blade drops down into the table. So it, you'll get a little nick and not a, not a gruesome injury. Um, so the safety lesson to be learned there is pay attention to your safety functions because knowing the right thing to do and doing the right thing are, um, you know, accidents happen regardless of knowledge and regardless of, of care. So the human component should be regulated out the best, best as possible. And then also, you know, if you don't know what you're doing, have a surgeon with you in your wood shop, right? That's right. That's right. <laughs> if you can afford a surgeon, that's the most important thing to have in your wood shop. Now, what about your family, Richie? What can you share with us about that? Uh, family. Yeah, I've, um, so my wife and I have been married, uh, for about seven years now. Oh, uh, she, she went to med school down in Mobile, um, where I was working with president at the time and she's from the Birmingham area. So we had a, um, a coworker's wedding, um, uh, uh, my plus one that I was going to take kind of fell through. Uh, it turns out after I learned after the fact that I had never sent in the RSVP, so I didn't even officially have a, uh, a plus one to begin with, but, um, <laughs> sorry, Paul and Jessica, but, um, but anyway, so we had a co, uh, another coworker whose husband was in school with Lane. Um, and she said, Hey, I've, uh, you know, sorry about you not having your plus one anymore, but, um, I've got a friend of mine coming in town. Uh, can she go, can she take your plus one and go, uh, to the wedding with us so that I can still attend the wedding, but I don't, uh, but I can still hang out with her while she's in town. So I said, yeah. Uh, so I took her to the wedding. Uh, I think the next wedding we attended was our own. Uh, we, uh, we hit off, hit it off well at the wedding. Uh, she'd actually just moved uh, back up to Birmingham. So she had, she had been in Mobile for a long time, but I didn't meet her in earnest until she'd moved back to Birmingham. Right. So we, uh, it's, you know, it's a four hour drive or so. So we dated, uh, you know, she would come in town and I would go to visit her some, um, we dated remotely for a while or long distance for a while. Uh, and then, uh, we were getting more traction with one of our local, um, clients here in, in Birmingham. And there was an opportunity for me to, to move up and felt like I needed a change of pace anyway. So I moved up to Birmingham, ended up getting married, um, so yeah, that was seven years ago or so. We had our first son, Thomas, pretty early in our marriage, um, and I was I was I was content to stop there. Uh, one was fine with me. We'd we'd actually talked about adopting a second, um, so that was. But my wife, you know, she um, she really wanted a, a second one, uh, and I suspected if the second one wasn't a girl that she was going to try for a third. So. I, I, I was, uh, I attempted to cut that off and said, all right, we'll, we'll do a compromise. I'll agree on the second, right. uh, under the terms that under no circumstances are we, will there be a third? And, uh, so she agreed. There you go. And then she immediately violated our agreement by having twins. Ah. Uh, so, so we, uh, they're two years old now, uh, a boy and a girl. And I'm a big fan of them. 
so I've forgiven her for breaking our agreement, but <laughs> I'm, uh, I'm on board with it now. Um, but uh, yeah, and so it, uh, you know, the house we were in at the time, um, we had bought uh, saying, you know, we have just enough room here to grow one more. We can have right, right. this, uh, this other child. Uh, and then uh, we found out at our ultrasound that it was going to be two. Uh, and my parents also moved in with us. Um, so we went from having, you know, we bought a house and said, all right, this is going to be good for us. And one more, well, that one more turned into two more plus two more adults. So, uh, so I bought the house we're in now. I, I built a studio apartment down into the basement that my parents live in. Um, and you know, if that's a, that's another positive about woodworking is that you accumulate all these tools and, um, uh, it, they, they all pay for themselves if you use them well. So I've, I've remodeled the last three houses we've been in. Um, I remodeled this one before we moved into it, uh, you know, contracting out some of the stuff and then, you know, doing the more detailed cabinetry and vanities. I've, I've built all of our vanities out of Walnut. Um, I did, uh, all of our balustrades and stuff like that. I did. Yeah. Um, so it's a, it's a hobby that kind of pays for itself. But anyway, so yeah, uh, finished the remodeling here while we were still making it work in our old house, uh, cool. finished a studio apartment down in our basement, uh, where my parents live in and that has its own challenges, but it's also been an overwhelmingly positive experience, especially for my, my kids. Um, I'm not sure how we'd have navigated working, from home during the pandemic with kids without that extra help being here. So, right. Yeah. That's the family. I hear you, man. Sounds like a great family. Now we, we also do one thing I, that's, I love to do is just get to know our people a little bit better. L- quick lightning round. Just a couple of questions I'd like to throw at you off the top of your head. Just uh, whatever comes to it. Okay. Mm-hmm. Favorite food, man. Uh, probably sushi. Nice. Adult beverage. Adult beverage, uh, Blanton's bourbon, uh, on the rocks. All right. I'm coming to hang out with Richie in Alabama. All right. <laughs> all time favorite movie. Never had one. Never had all time favorite. How, all right. How about band? Band? Yeah. Uh, never had one. Well, what, what type of music do you enjoy then? Cause you're a music guy. Yeah. I mean, I've never had one because I, I enjoy different people at different stages and, uh, and you know, enjoy bands for the contribution they make. Um, so it's, I wouldn't say I've ever really had a, okay. Had what's a favorite. Your, what's your favorite app? Favorite app. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm, uh, I'm not really, you know, I work a lot in tech and I, and I try to avoid it otherwise. So I, I uh, my phone screen is, you know, my, I've got an iPhone and it's, there's one screen. Uh, I don't have a, a lot of apps and stuff like that. So I, I'm not really an app guy. Not an um, app guy. Okay. Well, what's well my, but I do have a favorite app. It's okay. Reddit. Uh, Reddit's my favorite app. I'll, I'll go there. Reddit. All right. Sounds good. Now, what's on your nightstand? What's on my nightstand? Is in what devices or books or what? Whatever it is. Uh, well, I I uh, I have a CPAP because I hit the genetic lottery and have uh, obstructive sleep apnea. <laughs> right. Uh, I have what's on my nightstand now. I have a, a phone charger and a watch charger and a couple of books. Okay. Now how about last question, dogs or cats? I like them both. Uh, you know, my favorite pets, usually my current pet. Um, so, and you know, I, I just like the one I've got at the time. Uh, right. Our current, our current cat Leonard is a fat, useless exception to that rule. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but uh uh yeah i like them both there you go well thanks for playing the, the lightning round rich that was a lot of fun man mm-hmm. look it's been it's been a great hero episode getting to know you we wrap up eco ask why with the why richie so somebody wants to know what your what your personal why is what would that be personal why is like why do, why do i i do specifically what i do well, no just your it, what are you pat you know your personal passion you know what drives you as richie you know, what would that be? Uh, what drives me is Richie. Um, so uh, I think underlying all of it would be faith. Um, what what describe what drives me, I guess, particularly in, in the in the in the the work and and uh, context. I think um, in short would be people. Um, like I, I used to be 
like dogmatically minimalist. Uh, I had a, a set number of each article of clothing I would own. And if I bought a new one, it, it was, I had to throw away one of the old ones or donate one of the old ones. Um, I had two towels that I washed in rotation. Uh, I had a, and this is up to basically when I met my wife, I had a, a, only a bed in my bedroom because um, I didn't have any clothes or many articles of clothing. I, I just had a little hanging unit in my closet. Um, mm-hmm. So I didn't need dressers and stuff like that. And I think in my living room, I had a love seat, a small chair and a TV um, and no other furniture in my house, no dining room table or anything like that. Uh, so I lived really lean, all of my clothing then and now uh, fits into a large suitcase or a single hamper. Um, Cause I, you know, I, I went through a year where I did, um, I think I traveled about six months out of the year uh, and I just come off of a pretty, like a string of assignments and I came back in my house and I had all this stuff sitting there and I'd been living in a, a hotel room, which is sparsely appointed, but everything has a place and everything has a, has a thing, uh, has a, you know, has a reason. Um, and living out of the suitcase. And then I walked into my house and it's just like, why do I have all this stuff? I've never sat down at that table and, and eaten a meal, you know? Right, right. Uh, so, uh, so anyway, I, I used to be, uh, I used to live pretty lean. Um, marriage and, and kids have, have made me less dogmatic. Um, I still have my set number of each article, article of clothing and such. And, but I have a dining room table now and I have a house full of toys and knickknacks nobody uses that, previously would have eaten away at me. Um, there's usually more clutter on my countertops than I'd like, but you know, I, I know one day that I'll walk into our toy room and my kids will be older and there won't be any more toys, um, in the toy room to pick up. And that'll be a sad moment for me. Um, you know, if I ever lost my wife, I'd, I'd be pretty bummed about the cleanliness of my countertops. Um, because, because it would remind me of what wasn't there and, and why. Um, so I've learned to manage and appreciate what I would otherwise understand as clutter and, and unnecessary things because of, uh, of who those things point to, um, yeah. while still trying to maintain my own personal perspective on things as they relate exclusively to me. So I say all that to say that on my own, I don't really need much. Um, so there's not a lot that drives me, um, you know, other than just, you know, like I said before, um, you know, you know, the ideas of, you know, creating something beautiful and things like that. Um, so I, I prefer to have a few things, but I and prefer to have to really enjoy those things that I have. And in retrospect, the work that I used to do and the things that used to drive me, um, uh, it, it, you know, it kind of feels empty in retrospect. I don't really know why I was kind of churning forward and right. with any kind of uh, determination or any kind of, because it, I, I couldn't identify then and I can't identify now the point of it. Um, mm-hmm. But now my personal why uh, for most things would be um, some person or some group of people. And that's often my family, but it, it covers others as well. Right. And, and paradoxically, I'm a person who, who covets alone time as well. So when I do things exclusively, exclusively for me, those things involve me retreating temporarily from those very same people that I talked about before. Um, so I, I think, you know, the balance there is important. The things that I do or um, I have people as my object of why I do those things. Yeah. You know, how can I, how can I be in a position to help people in my community? Um, how can I provide this or that or um, for, for members of my family? And then the other side of that is the things that I do that are, that aren't linked to people are usually exactly intending to remove myself from those people for a little <laughs> while. And, all right, well, Richie, this has been a lot of fun getting to know you. Wonderful hero conversation. You definitely are a hero. Thank you for for just so much you shared, uh, just the wonderful insights you gave to others as well, so the, the advice that you that you pointed to earlier in the conversation. and Just had a lot of fun with you here on Eco Ask Why. Yeah, thanks for having me. Yes, sir. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Eco Ask Why. This show is supported ad-free by Electrical Equipment Company. ECO is redefining the expectations of an electrical distributor by placing people and ideas before products. Please subscribe and share with your colleagues and friends. Also, leave comments, feedback, and any new topics that you would like to hear. To learn more or to share your insights, 
visit ecosy.com. That's E-E-C-O-A-S-K-S-W-H-Y.com. 